Hey guys, in this video we're going to be taking a look at this small plane which is the Ichin Flying Fish and it's one I'm quite excited about and I'll explain why. So in this video I'm going to cover the different variations you can buy and the build of this plane. We're going to take a look at the stock analog setup and some footage from it. We'll also look at my digital FPV install. We're going to see how durable it is in a crash and I'm going to give this model a review with some positives, negatives and points for attention at the end. And then we'll just finish off with a bit more of that park proximity footage uh, like you saw at the start of this video. So I'm gonna jump straight in and let you know why I love this little plane so much. And basically because it's so small, light, pretty much silent, and because it looks like a toy, it doesn't look very aggressive, it means I can basically get away with flying this almost anywhere. So I can fly this in places that I would never think to fly any of my other FPV planes, such as the local park. And I'm finding that local park proximity is really good fun. With that said, let's move on and take a look at the two variations this plane is available for purchase. So you can get this in the PNP or you can get the FPV version. The PNP is the usual deal where you get your ESCs, your motors, your props, and all of the servos all pre-installed and the FPV version is all of that plus you get an FPV camera which is a Foxeer Razor Nano and you also get an Atom RC 500 milliwatt 5.8 VTX and again all of this comes pre-installed. For me the really nice thing about the FPV version is you add your receiver, add your battery, some minimal assembly which we're going to go through shortly and you're ready to fly. No messing around with soldering, no wiring, it's just so simple and easy. Unless you already have some really good analog gear that you want to put into this plane or if you want to switch it to digital then I would recommend the FPV version as it's only around 20 euros more than the PNP. At the time of recording this the PNP in the CZ warehouse on Banggood is 83 euros and the FPV version is 103 euros. So here it is straight out of the box. These are all the parts that you get. All I've done is remove the bubble wrap um, it's nice that you get a user manual and multiple spare parts, so you get four props rather than just two. And you also get a second canopy, so the, the main one is nice and smooth. The second one has a space for mounting something, I'm not too sure what that's for, um, but I will make use of that later. You get these little foam inserts, so one of them is to blank off where the FPV camera is if you're not going to use that location. I'm not too sure what that second part is for. Um, and I quite like that it is already mostly pre-assembled and it has this nice little two-in-one ESC board which is mounted to the underside of the main wing which is also a 5 volt beck and also routes the aileron signal to your receiver through this connector on the end. So using the supplied cable that connects here on the other end it has two servo connectors which plug into your receiver. And the nice thing is what they have done is they've separated the two channels for signal to the motors. So if you want to, you can run differential thrust, but they are connected to the same pin by default. So you can separate those if you want to. Personally, I had no interest in doing that. The rudder works really well on this plane, so no need for differential thrust from my point of view. The motors on this plane are Ichin 1105 5000 kV and they come with some tri-blade three inch props, which are 3016s. This setup is designed for 3S, uh, although I do run 4S on mine. The only reason I went with 4S is because I only had 4S batteries in the right size to fit this model. So without buying new ones, 4S was my only option. The ESC is designed for two to 4S, so as long as I take it easy, I think it's absolutely fine to run 4S. The model comes with digital servos installed all round. They're 4.3 gram and they're each in branded. Um, the linkage and control horns all look sufficient. I like that the control horns are glued in and have the carbon fiber spars that are reinforcing the control surfaces also run through the control horn. So that's really nice. 
Um, also, they're all linked up and connected and they seem to be in a good position, in a neutral position, straight out of the box. Apart from the elevator, which is one that you need to actually set up yourself manually when you assemble the plane. If you purchase the FPV version like I did, you'll have the Fox Ear Razor Nano already glued in at the nose here. And then under this main hatch, the Atom RC VTX is also installed with a linear antenna. In the instruction manual, you'll find all the details on how to change the channel and also how to switch the power level. You can switch it between three levels with the highest being 500 milliwatt. Moving on to the build of this plane now. In fact, it comes pretty much pre-built, so let's just call it assembly. There's a few small steps to get it ready to fly. So firstly, we take the horizontal stabilizer there and that just slides onto the back. And while doing so, making sure that the elevator linkage um, goes through the control horn. And then you'll need to put a thumb screw in the bottom there to hold that horizontal stabilizer in place. And also you'll need to tighten up the linkage when that is in a central or neutral position. The next part is in the kind of rear electronics bay, you want to fit your receiver. And then there are four servo plugs to connect to your receiver for the four channels, which is obviously the throttle, uh, ailerons, rudder, and elevator. Um, and then what we do is we place the main wing on, and there are two kind of plastic screws that hold that in place on the top. And, and then you can replace that top hatch cover. Next, you fit your battery. Uh, in my case, I did swap out my connector to an XT60 to match the batteries that I have, but it does come supplied with an XT30. And then you just need to get your battery in the right place to get CG. And the CG is marked on the underside of the wing by some small bumps. That suggested CG does work pretty well, so once you can balance it there, I think you're good to go. So my specific setup on this plane with the analog gear, in the rear bay I installed a six channel Crossfire Nano receiver, the PWM version, so you can plug the servo connectors into it. And then in the front bay for the battery, I used a 500 milliamp 4S LiPo. As I said, I used it because it was the only one I had that would fit, but it actually works quite well. The battery weighs around 68 grams, and I had to push that right back in order to get CG. Another small change I made from the stock setup was I removed the linear antenna off the VTX and replaced it with a circular polarized one I already had laying around. I only did that because my receiver antennas are all circular polarized. The all up weight of this setup on the analog gear was 229 grams. Okay, I think it's time now to take a look at this thing in action. So first of all, we're gonna take a look at the first couple of flights of this thing using the analog gear. So this will give you a good idea as to how it performs, but also how the analog gear performs and what the image quality is like from the Foxeer Razor Nano. And launching such a small and light plane is super easy. And with its counter rotating motors, there's no torque roll to worry about either. As you can imagine, the quality that I was seeing live was a bit better than this because the DVR recordings are never quite as good. But this gives you a good idea as to the quality of the FPV gear that comes with it. This Foxeer Razor Nano is okay, it's average. It's not gonna compare to your high-end cameras such as the Caddx Rattel. Um, you can definitely see it struggles with the lighting, um, with even the ground it goes light and dark when you fly towards or away from the sun, and the wide dynamic range isn't quite as good as those larger cameras, but it is perfectly adequate for this little plane. Something I realized about this plane quite quickly was that it seemed very stable for something that weighed only 229 grams. In this flight here, the wind was around six miles per hour, which isn't much, but still that kind of wind usually affects these smaller models a lot. So I would actually go as far as to say that this is the most stable sub 250 gram plane I've ever flown. However, at the end of the day, this is still a small and light model. I don't want you to go buying it thinking that this is going to be the most super stable thing that you've owned. If you fly it in winds above 8 10 miles per hour, it's physics that this small thing will get bashed about more than a big plane. Fly it in light winds and it's great. Now I'm about to go full throttle and you will notice it becomes a bit twitchy, so here it goes right now. So it becomes a little bit harder to control and Maybe this is because it's going faster than the airframe is designed for. Um, after all, I am running 4S when this thing is designed for 3S only. 
So yeah, it becomes a little bit unstable. Now, it is sold as a glider style plane. I don't feel like this thing really flies like a glider, but at the same time, the fact that it is called a glider maybe implies it's not designed for high speeds. For me, this plane excels when you're cruising around at mid throttle. And if you want to go high throttle, this maybe isn't the plane for you. It's not really designed for speed. As I mentioned at the start of this video, one of the things I really like about this plane that makes it such a good park flyer is it's almost silent. So let's check out some footage of launching it and some flybys. As you can probably tell from this footage, even when the throttle is slightly higher on launch, you can only really hear it until it's about 20 metres away. So I took this thing out a few times and I have to say it took me completely by surprise. It flew so much better than I expected to and I was really enjoying flying it. I was getting a real buzz from flying it around the local parks where I wouldn't usually be able to fly any of my planes. So at this point I decided it was time to splash out and upgrade it to DJI so that I could fly this in digital HD. And I installed a Caddx Polar Vista on it. And I did that by taking the analog gear off and then experimenting with the positioning for the CG. I've seen someone else put the Vista camera and antenna all on the canopy and still get CG. Um, I'm not too sure how they did that because for me that was way too nose heavy. Maybe they were using a lighter battery and a heavier receiver up the back. But this is what worked for me in the end. So I've pretty much got the Vista on the CG line and then I've just cut a hole out for the antenna and that's kind of wedged in place. And then the camera is glued into the secondary canopy. Now, as you can see, I did have to cut some foam away uh, so that the camera had a kind of clear view. I'm not, as I, as I said at the start, I'm not too sure what this canopy was designed for because if you do put a camera in there, it gets blocked by that kind of uh, cockpit basically so yeah I've cut that away so that you can see it does have part of the plane in shot as you'll see um, but I can, I can live with that. The hatch on the top that covers the analog VTX and also covers the screws for the main wing I didn't mention at the start that this actually is a little bit loose uh, for my liking so I do put tape over it to hold it in place so once I have put the Vista in place I did tape the two pieces of the hatch back down the Vista itself is actually just a friction fit. It kind of just wedges in between the foam there. So there's no glue holding that in place and that's been absolutely fine for multiple flights, including inverted flying. And in terms of wiring, I've just simply soldered uh, power and earth cables straight from the Vista to the PCB. So the Vista is getting direct power from the LiPo. Then the final touch was just to glue in that supplied piece of foam to blank off where the original camera was. The all-up weight after this conversion went from 229 grams up to exactly 250. And here is a short DVR clip just to show you the results. So this is recorded on my DJI goggles. I'm still new to DJI and getting to understand things. So I've noticed with this Polar camera, you can't set it to prioritize image quality like I do on my Alba Bird with the standard DJI camera. Uh, this is set to prioritize latency instead which is probably quite a good thing for this plane anyway because I am flying low and round objects. Um, but I also got this camera because of its low light capabilities and the ability to fly in evenings. Okay, let's take a look and see how this thing fares in a crash. It's made of fairly standard light foam, but because the plane itself is so light, it is hard to do damage to it. So here's a few clips of clipping branches and hitting a tree. This photo was taken straight after that crash and as you can see the nose is still in perfect condition. In fact there's not even a scratch on the whole plane even after clipping loads of trees. So it's holding out pretty well so far. The only bit of damage I actually did in that last crash was I ripped my antenna off the VTX. That probably wouldn't happen with the stock antenna because this clover leaf is a lot more likely to catch the tree. At this point we'll do a quick review summary with the positives, negatives and points for consideration. 
and in the background there is some DVR footage recorded over the last two weeks in various locations. On the positive list, the first item is that it is very stable for a Sub 250, the most stable that I've ever flown in this category, and it just flies really well. Next, I feel like the build quality is pretty decent. I like that it's got the reinforced control surfaces and those spars go through the control horns. It comes with the digital servos all round and it seems like the foam can take a bash into a tree here and there. It's almost fully assembled out of the box so it's nice and quick for you to get into the air. You can basically fly this thing anywhere because it is silent, small and lightweight and non-aggressive looking which for me is one of the biggest positives of this plane. It comes with spare parts and it comes with a manual, again this is something that's fairly rare in this hobby and yeah it's just a lot of fun to fly. I really am quite excited going out to fly this thing. Next on to a small list of negatives. The first point is as you saw earlier it's not very stable at high speeds. But again, this might be down to the fact that I'm running 4S, which it's not designed for, and I might be just flying it too fast for its speed envelope. The next point is, you can't buy this in kit form. So if you do have a crash, you do manage to damage the airframe and you can't repair it, you're gonna have to buy at least the PMP and all of the electronics again. The last point is this top hatch that covers the VTX and the main wing screws. It doesn't seem to fit very well for me, it's quite loose, so I cover it in tape. It'd be nice if there was something to kind of hold that in place, like a thumb screw. Uh, and also the air scoop design, which I guess is designed to cool the stock VTX. It has a really big opening at the front, but the tiniest of openings at the back. For effective cooling of the VTX, that exhaust hole really should have been larger. Having said that, I never had any issues with my VTX overheating when I was flying it. And finally I have some points for consideration. These are things I thought were worth mentioning but maybe not necessarily negatives, although some people might take these as being negative. The first one is that this plane is not going to be stable in really high winds. It's just physics, it's small and it's light. So if you are in an area that's always windy, or if you want to be able to fly in high winds, I would suggest a larger, heavier model. The second point is that the battery bay is very small. And I know a lot of people these days like to build their own lithium ion packs. So I thought it was worth mentioning that the best you're gonna do is you might squeeze a 2S1P in there. And the last point on a similar topic is that the rear bay is also quite tight on space. Uh, the one where I have my receiver. And I know some people will want to fit a flight controller so they can run iNav. Um, but it will be a little bit tricky because you are limited on space. Although people have done this, so it is completely doable if you want to do that. Personally, I think this plane is perfect without flight control. In conclusion, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you at this point that I do highly recommend this plane. I really think it's a great little flyer and it is a lot of fun. In my personal opinion, this plane is best suited to 40 to 50% throttle cruising, low to the ground, weaving in and out of the trees at your local park. As per usual, I try and keep these videos as short as I can while giving you the essential information. So I might have skipped over something, and if I have, please let me know in the comments below and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for watching.